Good evening, KZFR. I hope everyone is having a good night tonight. Uh, well, before we start the show, I wanted to mention a couple things. Um, first off, if you want to submit and be part of Writing On Air, you can do so at write.onair at gmail.com. Had to think about that for a second. Or find us on Facebook, uh, Writing On Air, I think is what it is. Natalie can double check me if I'm wrong or not. Sure. She says sure. <laughs> Uh, and we have a YouTube page as well, so you can contact me or reach out through all those means. And uh, is don't forget that we have a themed prompt um, in the works. Uh, I believe it was key. Yes. Yes, Natalie says yes. Mm -hmm. So if you want to submit to that, we're kind of uh, waiting to have enough submissions to start uh, its own show. So if you want to submit and write a piece about key, whatever that um, inspires in your mind, please do so and submit. So tonight we have a famous author with us, Anthony Peyton Porter. <laughs> And I'm going to lift directly from his bio online, anthonypaytonporter.com, where you can find his books and other publications. So, Anthony Peyton Porter left his hometown in the mid-80s, settling first in St. Paul, then absconding to Minneapolis, where reliable witnesses heard him muttering on Twin Cities Public Television, right on radio, and Minnesota Public Radio. Promising the usual eternal love, he invigilated? Invigilated? Invigled. I've never wow. actually seen that word. Amazing. <laughs> Um, artist Janice Lee Perry into marrying him. She put up with him as best she could and died in 2012. After fleeing Minnesota with his accomplices in 2003, he turned up in Chico, California, doing the same darn thing on KZFR, just like nothing had happened. A regular reader gushed, I have rarely been this turned off by an author. In these few columns I have read of his, he has defiled teachers, children, and dogs. Mr. Porter has not defiled any dogs since the late 90s and wishes certain people would get on with their lives. David Hinsber Hingsberger adds, forgive me, but Anthony Peyton Porter is a total jerk. Mr. Porter has admitted responsibility for the quotations on the walls of Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial at First Street and Second Avenue in East Duluth, Minnesota. Carla Stetson uh, designed the memorial and it's a stunner. Go see it. That's right, Duluth. Jump at the Sun, the story of Zora Neale Hurston can still be found at Barnes and Noble and Amazon.com and poorly supervised children's bookstores. A few copies of Can He Say That are gathering dust at Black Oak Books in Berkeley and Carol's Books in Sacramento. Mr. Porter was once accused of poetry by people who claimed to know, but it all blew over and he seemed fine, and he seemed fine for years. Recently, he's been heard mumbling about trochaic uh, this and anapastic that, so there's no doubt this time. You may as well know that Peyton, uh, that Mr. Porter has finally ended up in prison, teaching creative writing for the William James Association at High Desert State Prison in Susanville, California. My goodness, that is packed and wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How is your day going, uh, Mr. Porter? Anyway. Yeah, it's going fine. The sun is shining. I'm upright. And I can get around. I can see you guys, hear you. Can you? So I'm fine. I can. Okay, good. Good, good. <laughs> well, I'm here anyway. Yeah, thank you for being on the show. This is... Um, a wonderful start so far. I love that intro. That is probably the best bio I've ever read yeah, for anyone. Yeah, it reminds me of my first author bio. I kind of like jumped really? all around and kind of made a joke about out of my achievements in a way. It's hard to take it seriously. It for really me is. And just do it straight, you know. Yeah. Who cares? Life there is a much more um, to the point one on Amazon. <laughs> yes. Well, I didn't have as many words to work with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love that uh, you work with something called Alternatives to Violence. Yes, I do. AVP is terrific. Uh, the Alternatives to Violence project was started in the 70s, originated in prison after the uh, riots at Attica in the 73, I guess it was. And so it's always, it came from inmates and it resonates with inmates. Mm -hmm. And I've seen hardened, uh, convicted murderers crying. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's experiential, so it's I can't. There's no way to predict what somebody will get out of the yeah. uh, workshop, but they always work. Yeah. Just to to find a way to let them release what's inside is. And to to get them uh, to understand <clears throat> that we're all fundamentally the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, you know, that somebody wears different colors doesn't really matter. Wow, yeah. So, That's incredible. Yeah, uh, it's an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. 
That's a lesson that needs to be taught at all levels at all times. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's the kind of thing I'd like to see the city of Chico sponsor AVP workshops all over town wow. for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, it would do us good. I think so. Well, I think uh, this should be a good time to plug your book. <laughs> sure, it's, plug. it's always a good time to plug my book. <laughs> <laughs> I find. Although it's hard to do because, you know, it's, uh, it kind of goes against the grain. But I've collected a bunch of essays, most of which started life as uh, radio pieces from KFAI in the Twin Cities where I used to live. Uh, many of them uh, were in the uh, Chico News and Review and as my column from the edge. Uh, and there are a hundred. They're only 20 cents each when you buy the set, wow. uh, and you can buy only the set. Mm -hmm. they're, at, uh, they're online at Itasca Books and locally at Blackbird Books, 1431 Park Avenue, and the bookstore, 118 Main in Chico. Wonderful. Right. Yes. Go go buy one. Mm -hmm. Please. I have please bought do. it. I've read it. It's excellent and I will endorse it here. Good. <laughs> buy Good. Mr. Porter's book. <laughs> right. Read Mr. Porter's book. Tell your friends. Tell your friends. Friends and family, <laughs> local acquaintances. I don't know why I was talking like that. Hey. <laughs> it just sounded more real. <laughs> it does. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I think um, we've talked about your book, talked about you. Let's dive into your pieces. All right. Okay. What are we starting with? Let's start with Nice Guy. Yeah. Nice Guy. This is from 2010. You've probably seen me around the neighborhood. I'm a nice guy. Ask anybody reputable. I have a lot of money. And if you've got some money, I will take it from you if I can. I will buy some of your people and give your adolescent males weapons and whoever's left will give me money. Believe me. Is this your wallet? If I need your money, then you keeping it is contrary to my interest. If I need your money, I'll have my brave goons kill you because I have a right to defend my interests everywhere, including your living room. And my interests are whatever I say they are. Remember that. Nice furniture. That's if I want only your money. If I want your land, or something I think is in your land, you'll have to move. Nice yard you got there. Love the lavender. By the way, you may have heard that just because I didn't like the way that man over there did things, I blockaded his whole lot. Garage, chicken coop, and everything. No food, no mail, no garbage pickup. No nothing. They could all just die. That's true. Remember that, too. My people seldom leave. Most of them know only what I tell them, so there they stay, in straight lines. Variations are against the rules and rule breaking is good for the punishment industry, so it's win-win. Criminal justice and <laughs> great branding. A guy out by the airport had the luscious lemon trees around, and mine didn't get through that last frost, so I pretended he had threatened me, and I sent 100 goons to secure his trees, like something might happen to them otherwise. And goons just happened to be outrageously expensive and terrific for the economy. Win-win. The trees are fine, and my courageous goons killed the guy who used to live there. They also blew up the garage and ripped out the wiring and peed in all the rooms. Now my people get to clean up on the cleanup. <laughs> so win-win again. Your place is very tidy. That's okay, too. I have intrepid goons stationed around the neighborhood, and now I see that having more would enhance my sense of security because I am scared to death of absolutely everything on your behalf. Ah, what the heck. More goons can only help. I feel better already. This is such a nice neighborhood. So safe. 
I'm the neighborhood watch too. So if you see anything suspicious, call me. Just me. What are your impressions, Natalie? The government. <laughs> <laughs> Not a nice guy. <laughs> a very nice guy. Was she accurate on that, it's Anthony? It's all for you. Oh, sure. <laughs> Absolutely. You can find this book at Blackbird. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, they ought to love it at Blackbird. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, a lot of my stuff, I, it seems to me, in retrospect, has to do with the role of government in our lives uh, and how that's changing and how it could be. Ways it adapts. Ways it adapts and, and encroaches and expands and inevitably, you know, no matter who's in office, it's always bigger when they leave. <clears throat> yeah. I love how personal you make it in this too, from from their furniture to their their lavender, all the little things that you point out are, that could be taken by the nice guy in this piece is just like <laughs> the lemon trees, like. Every so, little thing, every little detail that you put in here is just right to the point of all the little things that, that can be, as you say, encroached on. Um, we talk about like plots of lands and things that can be taken, but you never think about all those, those little pieces of our lives that, that can just is easily be snatched away by a little infraction or, or even just that we only have the police to turn to. And that's really a frightening prospect. If, if that's the way we actually think about things. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're encouraged to think about things that way. Yeah. You know, and uh, my guess is the goal is, for instance, just in terms of violence, is to limit violence to the state. Yeah. The state is the only one that can do violence on anybody. And, and you know, uh, so, for instance, if, <laughs> if the, the anti-gun guys for the most part get their way then cops will be the only ones with guns mm -hmm. i don't i don't even like the way that feels yeah you know? I, don't, I don't have that much faith in them yeah plus uh adding on to the comment you said about uh the little details in there um the way you wrote that i think is pretty um profound uh, it adds the details I'm referring to, it adds a, a really scary level of intimacy that I think sometimes we don't really perceive when we talk about government because we think, oh, it's just up in the clouds. It's just government on Washington, D.C., <laughs> way far away. Like, you know, it passes laws that we feel, mm -hmm. but we never actually see it or recognize it being there. Um, until it's personal. Until it's personal. <laughs> and so making it personal from the get-go in that piece, um, I'm a nice guy in your neighborhood, around, close to you, constantly <laughs> right, around. Right, always next door. around. That's in right. bed with you. Yeah. In bed with you. It, it, it adds, in your lavender. It yeah. adds um, a really unique flavor uh, to that of apprehension, of fear, of just kind of anxiety. And that's, that's a well-written piece. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yeah. Glad you like it. Yeah. It's snaky, the way you read it, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's creepy. It's creepy that crawly. was that was a compliment. Yeah, <laughs> I liked it. I liked. It. <laughs> well, that was a pretty uh, great piece there. But I wanted to read one. Um, I guess if I can, if I may, that I actually found pretty neat. Um, mainly just because of I guess I would say my last name. Um, <laughs> so bear with me. Uh, and I guess this one's pretty explanatory. So, um, might not even need to have much discussion after it, I would imagine, but it is titled cooking. And again, uh, before I go into that, this is from AP Porter's book. Can he say that? Can he say that a hundred from the edge? So cooking 2008, I was probably seven or eight when I started cooking spaghetti. Mostly I watched my parents cook, washing and chopping and a lot of frying, which is frowned on these days although that could change. Every vegetable we ate when I was a child was overcooked, or that's how I think of them now. They were all limp or mushy. Meats generally fared much better. That's probably why I'm an omnivore. My father, Pete, didn't cook often, and when he did, it was a very special occasion, at least to me. He cooked only a few things, pretty much like I do now. I'm not a generalist. Chili, meatless, and meaty. Oysters, fried, and raw. Porterhouse, and T-bone. Chitterlings, gumbo and shrimp and chicken and okra, yes, okra. 
beef roast, mmm, flesh. <laughs> Friday was a special day, and not just because of the weekend. Eki, my mother, was a kind of closet Roman Catholic, and we observed meatless Fridays. Her mother was Catholic, and I think Eki liked the pot and pomp and glitter. Eki's Catholicism was a furtive, was furtive because she'd been divorced, and she settled for being an Episcopalian instead. Our church had lots of marble and brass and hardwood pews, so she didn't miss much. Fried fish was the standard fare at Friday dinners. I was allergic to fish and couldn't even be around it when it was frying, so I'd try not to be there when we were commemorating Jesus' murder. In about the fifth grade, I had a class called Home Mechanics, mostly sewing and cooking. My class, and probably all the others too, made an apron, a potholder, macaroni and cheese, and raisin oatmeal cookies. Still my cookie benchmark. Actually, raisin oatmeal cookies are the only cookies I make. I've tried oatmeal raisin cookies, but only briefly. I like to cook for parties because I like big pots of stuff. Chili, beans, curry, soups, stews. Parties are helpful with my big pots of food because I find that much of what I like to eat my family are indifferent to, or, in the case of my sons, openly scornful of. Pete cooked for himself, too, and sometimes for him and me. Seven or eight years ago, I went through a green curry phase. A head or two of garlic, onions, coconut milk, add prawns, crawfish, and other creatures to taste. I ate that several times a week for months. Other than the occasional ungulate, I mostly do curries, and now and then I make a veggie chili for my meatless spouse. I tend to make a batch of red Thai, red Thai curry on Sunday afternoons, and then nuke it for lunch during the week. I find something I love, and then I eat it until I get tired of it. Sometimes that takes a long time. Back in the day, and sometimes at night, I'd cook for a woman. I still do, and not just in one pot, either. Man, I dig that piece. Um, I am a big fan of okra, <laughs> so when I, when I read through this, I was like, I have to read this. This is so cool. And I want to go back to um, stating how uh, genuine and kind your words feel when you read this piece. Um, it's, it's like home style cooking. It is, it is, uh, simplistic, but not in a, um, admonishing or degrading way, more of a, a very kind, thoughtful way. And I appreciate this style of writing. Um, you managed to kind of hit that on the head, like you're cooking a recipe for, for your listeners. And man, this book has been a serious treat. Um, yeah, this, this piece, uh, this piece stuck out to me. Um, not just because my last name is cook, but, uh, just because I, I often gravitate towards kind of the cooking recipe themed, uh, pieces. Um, cause I think that's all life is. So reading this piece was, was pretty solid because I was, I was pretty, pretty excited. So anyways, um, yeah. All right. Well, we are zooming through this, uh, this episode. So let's go ahead and dive into the last piece. Okay. Yeah. This is called what I love. I love it when people look at me and smile. I love it when I give my storage cabinet door just the right push and it closes quietly. Even though I'm leaning way over the kitchen table to keep from having to walk all the way around. I love interesting skies. I love it when Sammy, our neighbor's Siamese cat, walks within a foot or two of me in our yard like I'm not there. I love to face the sun, feel the heat on the bridge of my nose, and know that my sinuses are happy. I love when my son sits down with me for no particular reason. I love it when I'm watching a movie and I recognize characters Wordsworth quote or Salinger reference or the Jacob Lawrence reproduction on the wall, thus ever so slightly justifying my liberal arts education. I love big dictionaries and long, intricate, grammatically impeccable sentences. I love riding a bicycle. I love being able to touch my toes again. I love it when the strawberries on the bottom of the box look better than the ones on the top. I love a sax bridge between verses. I love when things get jangly and I remember that piece is right here within like always and I close my eyes and take a few deep, slow breaths, often in a parking lot or in line at the grocery store. Over and over, I save my life. I love reader letters that give me something to write about. I love chanting with my family. Ditto meditation with same. I love it when in the afternoon, the morning clouds part and the rest of the day is warm and sunny. 
I love it when, though, n nearly everybody I voted for lost the election, I can still take heart and joy in not living with a pol politician or in the Deep South, especially Texas. I love seeing people I barely recognize and remembering their names. I love not hearing traffic. I love being up before dawn when the house is quiet and I'm the only one awake. I, and I loved it when I recently went through six weeks of email and saw that some of you offered me sympathy, advice, and even loaners in response to my computer problem. I'm astonished and grateful. Thank you. I'm writing this on my repaired Mac because a reader told a friend of his who contacted and steered me to a consultant. The upshot is the repair shop that had my Mac when it passed out offered me a compromise, which I promptly accepted. The whole thing took 10 minutes. I love it and you. I love this wonderful piece and appreciating and being happy about being alive. <laughs> it is beautiful. That's the key, you know, because no matter what you see on the news right here, we're warm and comfy and Nobody's throwing anything at us. What? <laughs> Haven't gone outside yet. But. <laughs> <laughs> Give right. them time. That's right. No bombs, no snipers, no uh, internal bleeding. Mm -hmm. We're okay. As far as we know. Right. <laughs> yeah. We're okay. Right. We're, yeah, we're doing just fine. Yeah. So your readers do a lot for you as a writer? Sure. You, more than just like telling a great piece, they actually like do things <laughs> for you as a writer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. Tell us about that, because like, <laughs> I was told you can't do anything with writing, but evidently, if yeah. you're really good, your readers will. Sometimes they respond, yeah, in, in useful ways. And um, some the, the best part is if I can get something to write about. Now, that's not as important now as when I had a weekly deadline. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I always want to hear what people say. I can't, I mean, when, as an artist, or as a craftsman, you can't see what uh, the whole thing looks like mm -hmm. uh, when you're in the middle of it. Yeah. You know, the, if you're, if you're in, in a house, you don't know what color the house is. And so hearing from other people and how they react to things and interpret uh, my, ravings is always useful yeah you know, it's like a good editor you know, it's somebody a trained outside eye can tell you things you didn't know or a therapist for that matter it's the same kind of yeah. function yeah. can look help you refine things right like that. well we're at just the end here and so i'll ask you the biggest most open-ended question i can think of <laughs> um in you know three three and a half two and a half minutes here <laughs> <laughs> so good luck with this one um if you had to give advice to a new writer coming into this art style what would you tell them write uh every day and read the best things you can find uh, I would I'd suggest really that mo that you read the canon, the Western say of canon, <clears throat> uh, from Shakespeare, you know, to Calvin Trillin and William Faulkner and Hemingway, and um, I don't think that a you can uh, that a writer can improve without reading mm -hmm. good writing, and even if you don't understand it, then read it again. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's all I say just write and read to, but don't just write and not read anything as I've run across writers like that but you yeah. get in a loop uh, you, don't, you never get stretched uh, and you never run across something that's beyond you that's not you. healthy yeah. yeah agreed very much so right should I think of something else well, I'm trying to think. We've we got, got a, about minute a minute so. left here. Yeah. I don't know. This has been... How, a, do you, how do you write? Do you write physically in a book, like with pen and paper, or do you type it out? No. I use a, uh, my, I a, a Mac. A Mac. <laughs> like, I, I mean, Mac. first draft, do you always write, or is it pen and paper? Almost always. Since I've been te teaching in prison, we write in class, you know. Yeah. I have in-class exercises. 
which I usually do along with the inmates. Yeah. And so I've kind of gotten into the habit of writing more uh, by hand. But generally, I, I write on a computer. My first book I wrote on a, a by hand. Wow. Mostly because I didn't want to have to learn software right. oh, yeah. and write a book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, a lot. that's like learning I, to drive while learning stick shift. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's, too that's, that's too much. Let's just do uh, I know I can do this with notebook paper, so yeah. I'll right. do that. Right. <laughs> Well, that was perfectly timed. <laughs> Anthony, Very good. Anthony Peyton Porter, thank you for being here today. Well, thank you for having me. It's been fun. It has been a great show, and you have made it so. So I hope everyone enjoyed the show as well, um, as much as we did here in the studio. And have a good night, everyone. Be safe out there and stay warm.